Good morning this morning. Good morning. It is good to hear so many voices in the house of the Lord this morning. I am excited to once again get to uh, share the word with you this morning. Uh, before we get started, I have notes and an intro written, and I'm going to scrap most of that. Uh, I just want to be open and transparent as a pastor uh, with you this morning. Uh, what I'm speaking on this morning is not to you. It has first been shared with me. I have been working through this for a couple of weeks. Uh, at first, I'm pretty stubborn and bullheaded, thick scold. if you were to talk to my wife. Uh, I got the opportunity to speak at the, the, the men's retreat a couple of weeks ago, and it was uh, moving past cultural Christianity and, and, and what it looked like to be a real biblical follower of Jesus. And so I thought, well, this is good for me to share with other people, right? And then Pastor Alex asked me to speak, and he's like, I want you to speak on this chapter or this passage in James that talks about not being just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And it's at that point I'm like, okay, God. Okay, right? Maybe I should listen. Maybe this isn't for everyone else, but this is for me. And so this is something that I have been dealing with, and I'm just going to share with you what God has told me. Um, so we're going to be, uh, again, in James, uh, the first chapter of James, uh, verses 19 through 27 this morning. Now, as a, as a Bible-centered church family, we are surrounded by the Word of God. It's literally in the middle name of our church, Fellowship Bible Church, right? We want to be a people, a body of believers that study the Word, that know the Word, that teach the Word. We want to be good students of the Word, and we're truly blessed by the Word of God. I really believe that, and I'm thankful for it, but is it enough to just study and hear the Word? Are we called to listen to what God says in His Word and then leave it at that? Like I said, last week, Pastor Alex talked to us about how we're supposed to um, react when we endure trials, when we go through hard things. Today, James is going to keep walking with us, and he's going to teach us a fundamental truth about what it means to live as a person who follows Jesus, a person who has faith, and what that faith looks like. Now, James, we're not going to get into it today, but a lot of people think that James sometimes contradicts what Paul teaches when Paul is talking that we're saved through faith alone, and some people think that James is saying that it's about works, he's not. What James is saying is that if we have placed our faith in Jesus, then the fruits of our life will show that. Our works will show that we have faith in Jesus. And so James is going to break it down for us right here in this passage of Scripture, what it means for us to actually live out what we hear or what we read in Scripture, what we see uh, in the Word of God. It's not enough just to hear what the Word says. James says, do not deceive yourselves. What matters most is not just listening to the Word of God. It's about doing it. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It's not about checking off a checklist or doing the right things or making yourself a better person. It's about your heart. It's about the condition that your heart is in and that faith and that relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to dive into that. We're going to walk through this passage today and we're going to see what James is teaching us about what, it's, what it looks like to live in faith. And so we're, going to, we're just going to dive right into verse 19 through 22. And, and James says, My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we're going to go right back into the very first verse. Verse 19, it says, be quick, uh, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. This whole first passage, this whole passage has a lot of imperatives. And what's an imperative? I had to look that up, right? It means not to be avoided or excluded or evaded. So these aren't gentle considerations. 
These aren't some suggestions. James is telling us what we should do. These are commands. They, they are quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, get rid of all moral filth, humbly accept the word planted in you, don't merely listen, do what it says. These aren't optional. This is what we are called to do as followers of Jesus. Now, how are we supposed to understand or interpret this? Is, is James giving us a checklist? If you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this, then you've got it figured out? No. What happens when we have a checklist? I have checklists, and I, I, I begrudge them. If I give my kids a, a, a list of chores, it's just something for them to get over and get through so they can go on to do what they want to do. That's not what James is talking about here. That's not the heart of of what James is getting at. Take, pay quick attention to what, to what James says in the very beginning of verse 19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters. These are fellow believers. These aren't non-believers. So James is saying people that have a faith in Jesus, people that have placed their faith in Jesus, they're new believers, they're a new creation. When we invite Jesus into our hearts, we become a new creation. We should want to do what pleases Jesus. That should change who we are. It's an outlook change. Obedience is the outpouring and overflow of our heart. We should be so thankful and grateful for the mercy that Jesus has shown us and the grace that he has extended to us that we want to do what he says. We want to obey the way he calls us to live. It's not a checklist. It's not a bunch of things that we have to get through so we can be the best person that we can be. We should live in, in a response to this, this mercy and grace. And so then in chapter 19, he goes on to say, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. We're going to park here for just a little bit because we haven't even gotten to the real meat of this passage yet, and James is already throwing darts. Slow to speak, quick to listen first, quick to listen. Are you a good listener? If we're going to be people that live a life of faith, and we're going, to, we're going to have that faith that we're called to have, we should be quick to listen. Most people, not quick to listen. I thought I was a great listener. I'm, I'm going through school right now. I'm working on a master's in counseling. And so far, I've paid a lot of money to find out I'm a terrible listener. Terrible. I'm always listening in order to be able to respond. I'm not listening to what other people have to say out of genuine concern or care for their life, I'm just ready to convince them how they're wrong or tell them how they're right because they agree with me. James is saying right off the bat, before anything, we're supposed to be quick to listen. My grandma used to always say, why do you think you have two ears and one mouth? There's wisdom in that, right? We should listen twice as much as we speak. People want to be heard. And it's not just believers. We should be thinking about the people on the outside that are looking at us. There should be something different about us. Followers of Jesus should be those that are quick to listen. Proverbs 10.19 says, When there are many words, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is prudent. There's wisdom in watching what you say and being quick to listen with your ears. And the hits keep on coming. James goes on to say, slow to become angry. This is way easier said than done for me, personally. But why is anger, why is anger such a big deal? The, the short of it is it says right here in Scripture, because it does not accomplish God's righteousness. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to be slow to anger, because the righteousness that, is, that God expects and it comes from Him, anger doesn't, anger doesn't cut it. Human anger is destructive. It not only destroys ourselves, but the people around us, relationships we have with others. Unrighteous human anger should be avoided. James is saying here, he's commanding us, quick to listen, slow to become angry. We often think that when we're angry, it's justified. Now, I'm not saying there isn't righteous anger. There is. We should be angry for things that anger God. Injustice. There are things that, that are, there's righteous anger. But typically, the anger that we experience is selfish. It's because we haven't got what we wanted, we haven't been heard, um, and, and we have an agenda. And if the things aren't lining up, 
and people aren't falling into what our agenda is, we get upset. That's what James is talking about here. We should be slow to become angry. We get angry and we're frustrated and we're not in control. Again, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 says, A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. It's pretty black and white. God calls us to be understanding, not hot-tempered. And God calls us to extend grace to others. We're to be slow to anger. And so how do we do this? Outside of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, you can't. Just a quick disclaimer. But James doesn't give us like a 10-step anger management program or ways to love people and listen better. There's not a, you know, what do we tell our kids? Like, take a break, breathe the 10, inhale, exhale, and then come back later. That's not what James says. He gives us a couple of things that we need to do, and they're foundational. Number one, he says, Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James is telling us here first that we need to deal with all moral filth that is prevalent and evil inside of us. We can't live a life of faith on our own, and we can't live a life of faith when we haven't dealt with sin in our lives. First and foremost, moral filth and evil. We need to come to Jesus and lay that at his feet and ask his forgiveness. Ask him to come into our lives, clean that crud out so that we can then go and live that life of faith. So that we can be a good husband, that we can be a good father, we can be a good mom, daughter, son, whatever it is. Most importantly, we can be a good follower of Jesus. It's not about what we do. It's about our heart. It's about our relationship. And so first and foremost, we've got to deal with unrepentant sin. James is clear. Let's deal with that sin. We've got to cast that off. Whatever that sin is, that can, that can be jealousy, anger, bitterness, addiction. Whatever it is, we have to deal with that first. And then James draws our attention to the life-giving word here. Humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The implanted word that James is talking here is the, the gospel the word of the gospel, the life-giving word that's implanted in our hearts as believers in Jesus. What attitude should we have? It says we should humbly receive God's word. When we're challenged by the word to obey or to repent, we typically want to argue or resist that. We want to say, God, I don't know, maybe, what if we try this first? Now, that's what I do. Or I'll try to fix it. And God's like, no, clearly this is wrong, and you need to fix it. Oh, yeah, but let's start with this. Maybe that's a, that's a lot. Let's start small, Lord. And that's not how God works. We're supposed to deal with that, and we're supposed to deal with it humbly. Why? Because Jesus was humble. Jesus lived in humble obedience to the Father. Jesus in the garden asked, you know, if there was any way to let this cup pass from him, Father, please, but not my will, but yours. He humbly submitted to the will of the Father. That's what James is saying here. We need to humbly come before that word and let it infiltrate our lives, affect our decisions, um, and, and, and change how we do things. We should let that word take root and let it grow in our hearts and our lives. And so this is just the first section of what James is sharing about living a life of faith. He's not going to, he's come out of the gates hot, and he's not going to let up. Uh, verses 22 to 25, we're going to go through these. How do we humbly accept that implanted word? We do so by doing what the word says. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Do what it says. I know that that sounds super simple. It's not. And it needs to be addressed because as a church in general, not this church, but Big C Church, we're not really good about doing what the Word of God says. We're really good at hearing what the Word of God says. We're really good about showing up on Sunday and having a really impactful worship experience, hearing some uplifting words from the pastor or something that we don't quite like, and that's okay because we're just going to go home and start over. No actual change has happened. Nothing has affected our hearts. We live life like we did the Sunday before, and we repeat the cycle. 
James is warning us against doing that. If we're going to be followers of Jesus and live a life of faith, then we have to be doers, not just hearers. Do we need to hear this over and over and over? Yes. Over and over and over. We talked about it to our students or kids. We talk about it today. We're going to keep, this is probably going to be a theme you'll see throughout Scripture. Be a doer, not just a hearer. James knows that it's easy for us to deceive ourselves. We live in a culture where we see something online, like a social media platform or YouTube, and we'll hit a like or a dislike button, and then we'll turn it off and we'll move on. And that's the the extent of our engagement. Or if you're a little bit older generation, you watch the nightly news at 6 o'clock, 6.30, whenever that happens. 6, 10, whatever. You watch the news on TV. You look over at your wife and say, man, I agree or I don't agree. You turn it off and you go to bed. That's the extent of our engagement. James is saying we can't do that. We have to engage with what we hear. We have to let that affect our actions and and what we do. As followers of Jesus, we're not called to, to listen and forget. In verses 23 and 24, if you'll look with me, James uses this, he illustrates this with an analogy of a mirror. He says, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. So why do most of us, let's, let's look at this a little bit, why do most of us look at a mirror? I'm sure some of us Look at the mirror just to admire ourselves. There's probably a couple of us in here, but that's not the majority of why we look in the mirror. We look in the mirror to see an imperfection or something that we need to work on. Maybe there's something in your teeth, right? You go check and you've got that broccoli if you don't follow Jesus and like broccoli. <laughs> but there's something. Maybe you've got un, you need to shave. Ugh, like I try not to do that. Well, you, you guys saw this year I did it once, and we won't make that mistake again. I need wise counsel in my life. But maybe you need to pluck some some unwanted hairs. I'm not trying to out anyone, but I hear the front seat of your vehicle at a stoplight or in the parking lot provides some of the best light for tweezer work and unwanted hair, Heather. Um, Maybe you comb your hair. Maybe you put on makeup. But we use the mirror so we can fix something. How crazy would it be for me to look in the mirror, see the broccoli in my teeth, and go, huh, and then walk off and do nothing about it? It makes no sense. That's what James is trying to make a point here. How crazy is it that we would see what God wants us to do? We would hear the way God wants us to live and say, huh, and then walk off and do nothing about it. James is saying we need to be doers, not just hearers. It's crazy to have that information and to walk away and let it go. It's so important that we are people that do and he, do what we hear from the Word of God. Let's look at verse 25. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. I love Love, love this passage of Scripture. The expression to look intently into this perfect law. That's, that word, that's like when you kneel down to look at something and you stare real intently at it. You get down as close as you can and you're studying, meditating, focusing on what that word is. We study God's word with scrutiny and devotion. James is saying, yes, it's important. Study, study the word. But look, the Word of God here is expressed as the perfect law that gives freedom. That is so deep and so rich. We love the idea of freedom, especially in America, right? Fourth of July, let's get our our cut off the sleeves on our shirt, get us a nice cold beverage, fireworks, freedom, woohoo, right? We love freedom. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. We love that word and all the things that go along with it. What emotion do you feel when you hear the words law? Oof, right? Or even better, obedience. Oof. Sounds like a lot of not fun or somebody else telling me what to do. And as an American with that cultural influence, I kind of bristle. 
when somebody wants to tell me what to do. But James talks about the Word of God, and he calls it here the perfect law that gives freedom. How is that so? The Lord gives this law. There's freedom for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus. Jesus brings freedom from bondage, from sin. Jesus brings freedom through his word. The law of Christ that it's talking about here, that's not burdensome. It sets us free. Because we have Jesus, we have hope. There's joy. When we live in this law and we persevere in it, we're better for it. God comes alongside of us and works inside of our hearts and in our lives, and then we can then pour that out, that extension, uh, into others and those around us. It safeguards us and enables that life of freedom that only Jesus brings. And so this law, it's not burdensome. It's not overbearing. It's, it's freeing. Now James is going to kind of switch gears, and he's going to say, this is this is what I've told you. This is how we live as followers of Jesus. Now, you've got to remember, this is probably pretty early on in the life of church, in the church. Um, this is, it's talking about the dispersion. So this is probably one of the first instances of some widespread persecution of the early church. And people are, are new believers. These are probably, the majority of them are probably Jewish. And so these people have been dispersed, um, and they're going through it. And so James is kind of giving them some, some, a guidebook, ways to live and, and ways to do this new following Jesus thing. And so he's let them know things that they should do, and now he's going to go in even deeper and get really specific on what it means to live in this freedom, freedom-giving law. Verse 26, he says, If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Man, James... I just felt like, okay, Lord, beating me over the head. I get it. I get it. James is saying here, he's talking to believers. Let's remember that. But when you hear the word religious today, there's a pretty negative connotation with it. We either have a negative connotation with the word religious or we dismiss it because it's very general. There's nothing really specific about it. Um, You think of typically like regulations and rules when you think of religious, but James here, when he talks about religion, or to be religious, he's referring to outward expressions of an inward heart. So, uh, for example, religious people do some of the following things in our day and time. They go to church, they pray, they fast. A religious person will give, they serve. These are not bad things. We all, as followers of Jesus, should be doing these things, but we need to be doing them for the right reason. And James is calling some people out here. He's talking about the person that says one thing, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. I do all of these things, but you can't hold your tongue. That's what he's talking about. Your religion being, uh, what does he say here? Useless. And you deceive yourself. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about those of us who follow Jesus and we mess up. This is somebody, again, this is a heart condition and a heart issue. Let me change my notes here. It says here, uh, he says, to control your tongue. If we can't get a handle on our tongues, we deceive ourselves and our religion is useless. That control word that's in this translation, that comes from a bridle. And I don't know if any of you or how many of you spend time around horses, but a bridle is something you put in the mouth of the animal, and then it controls the direction that the horse goes. So James is saying here that we should have a handle on what we say and be able to control the words that come out of our mouth. If not, like our words should not control us. We should not be beholden to what comes out of our mouth. It should be the other way around. If we're going to say we follow Jesus, and we're going to be serious about doing what the Word says, then we need to be people that have a grip on what we say. Do we criticize other people with our tongue? Do we gossip about other people? How about on the internet, social media, where there's really no consequences? How do we interact with others? Do we have a bridle on our tongue? Are we controlling what we say 
or do we let the words out and then try to grab them and bring them back like I do? When a person has genuine faith in God and they're living the way God calls us to live, it's going to come out in how they talk and who they talk to and what they talk about. And if a person does not, that eventually is going to come out as well. And that's what James is saying here. Even if you're trying to sound religious, look at me, look at me, look what I've done. And from a worldly point of view, the occasional hasty word or a questionable joke or a half-truth, maybe a little bit of innuendo, sarcasm, we shrug that off as no big deal. But from God's perspective, what James is showing us right here That's a sign of spiritual immaturity. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, watch what you say. Watch what you say and who you say it to. James goes on in verse 27 and he says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Note here, James is showing us, again, it's a heart condition. Caring for widows and orphans and staying unstained from from sin, that's not like if you check those two boxes, you've done everything you need to do. But James is saying here, in the Bible, widows and orphans were some of the most vulnerable in society. Obviously, parents that don't have children, how are they going to provide for themselves? Widows would typically be someone whose husband had died and they didn't have children, especially sons. And so they were cast off from society. Women back then, if you didn't have kids, why have you around? And so they were often left to beg for scraps or work in some illicit ways, find illicit ways to make money. Um, And they were cast out and set on the side. And so James is saying, if we're going to be who we say we're going to be, if we're going to do what we read and not just hear what we see in God's Word, then we need to take care of the most vulnerable in our society. That should be something that's on our radar. And we haven't done a good job as a church. Look around, even just in our area over the past couple of weeks, I've been uh, given the opportunity to speak with some organizations. Uh, One of them is called like the Foster Collective here in town, and they work with uh, families that are looking to foster and or adopt. And there are thousands of kids just in East Texas that need a home. And we've placed that burden on the government, on the state, and we expect them to take care of it. That's a failure of the church. We were talking about this at small group, and, and a statistic blew my mind. You guys know that how I love statistics. But if one family, just one family from every church, just one adopted one kid, all of them would have homes. Church, if we're going to be who we say we're going to be, we need to do what the Word tells us to do. We need to care for those that are the most vulnerable, the orphans and the widows. There's people in our community and in our church that have lost a husband or that have lost a significant other, and they don't have anyone around them. We're called as followers of Jesus to step in, lean into that. You can see in society, just with the increase in, in, in the need for families, for kids, like the church has not done well at being doers and not just hearers. Do we have eyes to see this in the people around us? Do we have the heart for those in our communities that some people don't want to take care of? It's easier to let somebody else deal with it. Well, James is saying here, it's not for us as followers of Jesus to let somebody else do it. And it boils down again, not a checklist, but a heart condition. Jesus says the two greatest commandments were what? Love God and love others. It boils down to those two things. Are we going to put our money where our mouth is and love others? And then he says, keep yourself from being polluted from the world. This is so important. The church today shies away from preaching on this, but personal holiness is important. It's critical and it's crucial if we're going to live a life that honors Jesus. 
If we're going to do the word and not just hear the word, your personal holiness matters. So the way you conduct yourself, what you watch, what you hear, what you say, it matters. We, know, we don't need to conform to society and say, well, it's okay. I think God would be okay with this. I think culturally, culturally we're in a different place. Newsflash, God isn't cultural. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he said in his word is acceptable and good and holy and just. It's the same then. It's the same today. It'll be the same tomorrow. If anything changes, then you need to evaluate you. We don't need to evaluate scripture or what God says. Period. If we're going to cast off, uh, keep ourselves from being polluted by the world, we cannot, we cannot give in or condone a system in a society that goes completely contrary to what the Bible says. Period. James is warning against that. I know it seems like it was a long time ago and things were different, but they're not. And you can look around. As a church, we've not done a very good job, and we've lost a lot of the influence that we had. Heather and I were talking on the way to, to, to work this morning just how different culture is because we haven't kept ourselves separate. We haven't uh, maintained that personal holiness. So now, back, I don't know, even 15 or 20 years ago, there, everybody generally kept up, at least kept up the, the veneer of the, uh, the, like the Bible Belt. Like we should or shouldn't do this. This is morally acceptable. This isn't basically followed what Scripture said. Fast forward 15 years, and that is absolutely not the case. There is no objective moral truth. There is nothing that is, is completely black or white, yes or no. It's about what your truth is. It's about what you think is right. And not only that, is it, if you follow what is found in the Word of God, then now we're being um, not nearly as accepted almost hostile against. That's what happens when we don't guard against what James is talking about guarding against. You leave a little crack, some seeps in, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, until eventually you're going to have a problem. I don't want to get on a soapbox, but it's important that we do what the Word tells us to do, not just hear what it says and go home and go, man, that was a great sermon. When did the Cowboys play? <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going to touch that one this week. But to be unstained by the world means also that we need to refuse to be driven by our own appetites and desires and selfish goals. That's, that's what's hard for me. It's easy for me to go, you know, like the, the Word of God says this, so I'm going to do that. Or it says, don't do this, I'm not going to do that. It gets a little more difficult when doing what the Word of God says makes it inconvenient for me personally. Like applicable in your everyday life. Like, um, it comes down to what you say, what you watch. My mom used to always say, what goes down in the well comes up in the bucket. And I hated hearing that so much. But it comes from right here. Right? It's a, it's a foundational truth. What, what we put in our heart comes out of our mouth. And so if we're going to maintain what James is talking about here, if we're going to not be soiled by the world, to be set apart, then we need to watch what we say, watch what we do, what we put in. It's difficult sometimes. Sometimes I really like to watch that good shoot 'em up that speaks French. And it isn't uplifting and doesn't God honor God. Oh, Heather's always like, does, is that God honoring? And I'm like, man, dang it. Like, no, dang it. Thank you, Heather Spirit. Right? But she's right. And she's holding me accountable. So we can be people that follow Jesus and live a life of faith and example for others. All of these things. Listen, friends, it's not about how much we know that's most important. You can memorize Bible verses, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but it's more important to God to trust 
love and obey what he says. What counts before God is acting on what we hear and learn. There's going to be people, everybody at one point will stand accountable before God for what they've done. There will be people that say, Lord, I knew you. Lord, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not about just knowing or hearing. It's about doing. And so the goal also, though, is not about keeping a bunch of rules. It's not about changing ourselves into a good person. Newsflash, you can't do that. If you're trying to do that on your own, you will absolutely, 100%, every single time, fail. Without the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus, you cannot do this. But that should be our goal as followers of Jesus, is to live in a way that is honoring to God, and it is in right relationship with Him. It's only possible through the grace of Jesus. And I pray that as a church family, for me personally, for my family, that I'm able to humbly receive the implanted word that has been given to me and that I can put, put personal holiness where it should be in regards to priority in my life and to grow in that love and holiness by putting God's words into practice. Not just being somebody that hears it, but somebody that does it. Will you guys pray with me this morning? Father, thank you first and foremost for your son Jesus and the, the grace and mercy that we receive through him. Because of him, we can come boldly to the throne, Father. Uh, we have hope and we have joy and we just thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I pray that as followers of Jesus, God, that we would be mindful of the things we say and most importantly, that we would be doers of the word. That we would put what we hear and what we learn from your word into action in our lives. <clears throat> God, it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.